and then we're going to drop down to the 21st and read out to the end of the chapter. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, we're going to read the 17th and the 18th verse, and then we're going to drop down to verse 21 and read to the end of the chapter. Verse 17, this I say therefore in testifying the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds, having their understanding darkened, being alienated. Wait a minute, I'm in the wrong, wrong book. Forgive me. <laughs> Seventeen, eighteen, chapter five. I was reading chapter four. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now go down to verse 21. Submitting yourself one to another in the fear of the Lord. Say, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. He said, Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such things, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Let the church say amen. We thank God for the reading of his word. We give honor to the spirit of Christ. Each and every one is here tonight with us. We thank God for you. Tonight we're talking about the owner's manual on marriage. I hold in my hand the owner's manual for marriage, and that is the Bible. The owner's manual give you directions or guidance on how marriage should work successfully. Now, if you don't read the manual and follow the instructions, chances are you are going to have problems. Now, in marriages, lots of people are having trouble, and the reason is because they will not follow the instructions given in the manual. They don't know how this marriage thing is to be set up, how it is to be cared for, how it is to work, how to troubleshoot it, because they are not looking at the manual. There are two things that you have to do when it comes to the manual. You have to read it, and you have to do what it says. Some people read, but don't heed. And some people don't read and don't heed. But the key thing is that you find out what God's word says, and then you obey his word. Jesus said in St. John thirteen seventeen, he said, If you know these things, happy or blessed are ye if you do them. God tells us in his word how to have a great marriage. God wants our marriage to be off the chart because it is so great. But the sad part is that in most Christians' homes, it isn't. So let's look and see what the Lord has to say in the manual about a successful marriage. We need to first go back and tell you, how many of y'all, I know most of you all have, have, have been privileged to be blessed to have brought a new vehicle. With every new vehicle comes they call it the owner's manual. In that manual, that manual tells you how that vehicle is supposed to operate and everything about it. it. tells you about all the instruments and how you operate the instruments. 
and they tell you about the engine, tell you about everything about the tire size, tell you everything about the car. Now, if you don't read that manual, there are some things that might take place in that car that you would be unfamiliar with. And you would say, well, it seems like something wrong with the car. And it might be something very simple if you just go back into the manual and read it and find out where the problem is. They have troubleshots or troubleshooters in the manual to let you know if certain things happen, this is what you ought to do. And the thing is this, manual is only as good as not only if you read it, but if you obey it, follow what it says. A lot of times the things that's happening to our cars because we are not following the manual. The manual will tell you when it's time to change the oil, when it's time to get a tune-up and all those things. The manual will tell you all those things, but if you don't pay attention to it or if you don't heed it, you'll drive your car until it cut off. You'll never change the oil. But the thing is, a manual is good because we need to go back to the one who invented marriage, the one who brought marriage into existence. And let's go back to the book of Genesis. And let's look at the one who brought marriage into existence. Now, that's Genesis, the second chapter. And we're going to look at verse 21. And it reads, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now here it is. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now, we know God was the creator of marriage. And he brought marriage into existence because he said it wasn't good that man should be alone. So God made him a helpmate, and Adam called her a woman. He said, since she was flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone, she shall be called woman. And then the marriage vow is stated, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, the difficulty sometimes I, I have with especially society today is that their discussion about marriage, should it be between a man and a woman, is very easily uh, explained if you go to the manual. <laughs> The manual will tell you, it's a man and a woman, huh? And God put them together, and he called that a marriage, all right? Jesus said, he that made them from the beginning made them what? Male and female. Right? And he said, now what God has joined together, he said, let no man put asunder. So the manual tells us who is the author of marriage, who created marriage, who who's the one that's behind marriage marriage and God put it in the manual which is the word of God okay so let's go back to Ephesians 5 and let's read verse 17 and verse 18 because these are the key verses whether or not you know in a successful marriage you probably say well when you read it you know how in the world that's going to be the part that's going to be successful but when you see we'll as we go through the lesson you'll see say verse 17 it's a, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Notice what it says. Don't be foolish, but be wise, understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, the will of the Lord, the first thing we read, the will of the Lord is this, that man should be alone, that if he should have a helpmate, and that helpmate should be called a woman, and the two shall be called what? One. All right? Then it says this here. It says, be not drunk with wine, wherein is access, but it says, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, that's the key right there. If you have a pen, being filled with the Spirit is the key. All right? Now, two ingredients are 
required in order to have a successful marriage? The first one is you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of y'all know this owner's manual, this part that we're reading in tonight, is written to people who are filled with the Holy Spirit? The owner's manual right here is you can't do this without the Holy Spirit. You can read it. You can say, I'm happy about it. But without the Holy Spirit, you can't do what it's saying right here. So you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You have to have power for your marriage to work. You have to have power for your life to work. And that will enable you to live the Christian life. Jesus told them in, in Acts 1 and 8, he said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. In other words, you can't live this Christian life. You can't live a changed life. You can't go out there and conquer the devil. You can't go out there and witness to the world until you first get what? Power. You can't, if you're without the power, you ain't got a chance. And so the same thing goes with your marriage. In order to, to have a successful marriage, you got to be first filled with what? The Holy Spirit. All right? So now, that will enable you to have a successful marriage. That will enable you to be the husband <coughs> or the wife you are supposed to be. We cannot do this thing on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit, and we need God's help. Jesus said in St. John 15 and 5, he said, for without me, you can do nothing. Anybody who has been married for a while will tell you they give credit to God. If they really have read this manual and they understand this manual, they understand that the key source behind a successful marriage is obeying what the word of God says and following his word under the control of the Holy Spirit. Now, to be filled with the spirit, which is, stands in verse 18, this is a commandment and it's not a suggestion. God is not saying something you may want to try, but this is a commandment from God. To be filled with the Holy Spirit means that the spirit is in control of who? You. Now, if the Holy Spirit is in control of you, are you going to be doing the wrong thing? Acting the wrong way? Saying the wrong thing? No. If the Holy Spirit is in control. But if the, Holy, if the flesh is in control, what's going to happen? Everything the man you told you not to do, you're going to what? You're going to do it. All right? So now, Jesus said in St. John 15, 14 to 15, he said, if you love me, he said, you'll keep my commandments. Now, let me say this, that in the church and in the home, this is the most broken command in the Bible. Huh? Christians break this all the time because they are not filled or controlled by the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is a life changer and a home changer. And if I'm going to live a life filled with the Holy Spirit, when I come home, the Holy Spirit is in charge. When the husband is controlled and living by the Holy Spirit and the wife is controlled and living by the Holy Spirit, they will not collide with one another, but will live in peace and harmony. The Holy Spirit do not fight against itself. When the husband and the wife are living and controlled by the Holy Spirit, everything in the home is great. How many of y'all agree with that statement? Huh? That's the truth. That go for anything. On the job, in the family. When the Holy Spirit is in control, everything's in harmony and at peace. And th it has to be that way. All right? Now that's the first ingredient. All right? Now the second ingredient is this. The second ingredient the manual says for a successful marriage. You need to be focused on your God-giving job assignment. In marriage, God has given the husband a job assignment, and God has given the wife a job assignment. The difficulties that we run into in marriage is that we want to look at the other person's job description and see how well they are doing their jobs. Husbands always telling the wife that you are not doing that right, and this right, and that right. 
And the wife is all doing the same thing, telling the husband, you ain't doing that right, you ain't doing this right, or you ain't doing that right. huh? And neither one is doing their job. Your job is not to point out what he or she is not doing in their job description, but to do what? Your job assignment. All right? So two ingredients are required. You have to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you have to be focused on your job assignment. All right? Just, just do your job. Let somebody say, just do your job and lead the other ones to themselves. All right? All right, so now let's look at each one's job assignment. And I guess we got to start with the husband first. All right? Let's look at verse 25. Verse 25 says this here. Husband, love your wife. It said, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Let's go to verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He said, he who loves his wife loves himself. Now let's look at verse 33. It said, nevertheless, that every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And we're going to stop right there. So we see the husband, one of his job assignments, it says, a husband's job is to what? Love his wife. God said to the husband, love your wife three times. And he said that three times in nine verses. So that means it must have been important if he made it. All right. Now, this is the thing about loving your wife. Does she feel loved? That's the question you got to answer. No normal wife resents her husband's headship, provided that his love for her is what it should be. The very high standard is set before the husband. He is to love his wife even as Christ loved the churches. That high that's about the highest standard as you could think about when you try to do a comparison. So now, three things about loving your wife. <laughs> the first, let's look at verse 25. Verse 25 says this here. We're going to we'll, we'll see what this is like. Verse 25 says this. He said, husband, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church. And notice what it said. Gave himself for it. So when it comes to loving our wife, the first thing we got to understand is this. Christ sacrificed for the church, didn't he? That's what he did. Verse 25 say, he is the sacrifice for her. So what does loving your wife look like? It looks like what? Sacrifice. <laughs> a husband is not commanded to love his wife because of what she is or is not. The world loves those it deems worthy of love. He is commanded to love her because it is God's will for him to love her. It's love without conditions. You are to love your wife in the same way Jesus loved the church. Now, he's, he's showing us, as husbands, our job assignment. Now, he says, it ain't based on, you know, Jesus said something in, 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 when he was preaching on the mountain. He said, if you love those who love you, he said, what you did that was so great? You did nothing. He said, but, that, he said, but I say unto you, what? Love your enemy. Pray for those that despitefully. In other words, the way treat, people treat you or how people uh, act around you has nothing to do with your love. And this is where the sacrifice part come in. Notice who Jesus died for. He didn't die for the righteous. He didn't die for the good. He didn't die for the best. Who did he die for? He died for the sinner, 
for the ungodly, for the wicked man. That's what we die. And he loved them so, understand what I'm saying, that he put his life on the line for them. And now this is what God is requiring the husband to do. It goes for all of us as husband, not just one, all of us as husband. Now look, at this is what the manual, I'm reading from the manual. Now the first thing I told you, the manual said you got to have what? You got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And the next thing says you got to be what? Focus on your job assignment. All right? Now, so now, how do you do that is now the question. How do we sacrifice our life for our wives? The answer is verse 18. Be filled with the Spirit. The only way you can perform this is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. You cannot love like this doing this of yourself. Now, it is God asking us to give my life for my wife, perhaps. Huh? But most of the time, he is asking us to sacrifice our time, money, and our selfish pleasures for her. Sometimes you got to give up that football game. Sometimes you can't go play golf like you want to. Sometimes you have to take that, what you were going to buy away to give it to her. Is that sacrificing? <laughs> Look at the moon <laughs> I got <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we, we talking about loving our wives. All right. Now, another thing he tells us. Let's look at verse 26 and verse 27. That he might sanctify and cleanse it. This is talking about Christ and, he's, and his love for his church. With the washing of the water by the word. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So the next thing required in loving our wife, the husband is to be the spiritual or to spiritually lead her. That's how the Lord does the church. First he gave his life for the church. Then he sets the church apart. And he washes the church with the word to build it up. Then he is going to present the church holy and blameless. The Lord is working on his church so that it will be spotless, no wrinkles, no faults, or any such thing. The final presentation of the bride to her husband at a wedding is her most beautiful moment. And that is the way he is to keep her and present her beautiful in the spirit. He must be patient and long-suffering with her. It took God only six days to create the heaven and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested because he was finished. But when it comes to our spiritual life, God is still working on us. God leads us as shepherds, leads and care for his sheep. So the husband is to spiritually lead his wife. His job is to gently and lovingly and not forcefully, love her spiritually like Christ loves the church. To be that Christ-like man. Huh? Man, I'm going to tell you something. That got to be a job to present somebody spotless, blameless, huh? Beautiful. I mean, this, 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 is, this is how he's, he's doing the spiritual work for sanctified, setting her apart. And he, he's beautifying his wife. All right, she's going to be beautiful. Well, this is the same thing the husband got to do for his wife. Spirit, she got to be built up in spirit as well as in the mind and in the emotions. All right, and he should be the spiritual example in the home. In other words, would Jesus do what you did? You got to ask yourself. Would Jesus act like that? You got to ask yourself. Would Jesus stay home and send the wife to church? Would Jesus stay home and send the family to church? Huh? You're supposed to be the what? The spiritual example in the home. You're supposed to know them questions, them spiritual questions. Maybe your wife, she want to know some answers. You should have the answer because you should be spending time what? In the word. You should be that spiritual example, that leader where? In the home. If anybody praying in the house, who, who should be praying? The man. If anybody studying their Bible in the house, who should be? The man. And so 
you should set the example of spiritual worship in the home. That's your job. That's a job description that God has given to the husband. Now let's go to verse 28 and verse 29. It says, so ought men to love their wives as their what? Own bodies. It says, he who loves his wife loves himself. It says, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished it and cherished it, even as the Lord, what? The church. Lord, have mercy. These are some of the highest standards that you can put on a person. Is that right? First, he says, love it like Christ loved the church. Now, you, you say that's a high standard. Then he comes with another one right behind it. Love it like you love yourself. Huh? Then he tells you, you should live a spiritual example before her. Like Christ. Huh? That's a hard example, too. To walk and act like Christ is not that a hard example for. So that's our job assignment. Let's look at it. It says, he is, oh boy. He is to nourish and to what? Cherish her. All right? As the church is the body of Christ, so the wife is here regarded as the body of her husband. He cares as much for her welfare as he does for the welfare of his own body. The husband who loves his wife as Christ loves the church will no more do anything to harm her than he would do to harm his own flesh. Now I'm asking you this question. How many men out there will hit themselves in the head with a hammer? Not too many. How many men out there will shoot themselves? Not too many. How many men out there will cut themselves? Not too many. How many men out there will starve themselves? Not too many. Huh? When your body get hungry, you do what? You feed it. When you get thirsty, you do what? Give it water to drink. Notice what he said. This is our job description for the husband from the owner's manual. Now, the word nourish means to feed. It means to fatten. So to nourish a wife is to provide for her needs, to give that which helps her grow and mature in favor with God and man. All right, that's nourish. To cherish her means to use tender love and physical affection to give her warmth, comfort, security, and protection. It's a picture of a hen protecting her chicks. She watches over them and cares for them. A husband is supposed to cherish and nourish her, fatten her up. I'm not only talking about physically, but emotionally also. Because I was about to say, if it's all about getting them healthy, I think I did my job. <laughs> but it's more than that. <laughs> it was just fattening them up. I, got, I think I did my job. <laughs> but it's more than that. But he said you ought to nourish her and to what? Cherish her. All right? Now, when she needs strength, what? He gives her strength. When she needs encouragement, what? He gives her that. And so with every other thing she needs, the loving husband seeks to supply all the needs of his wife. Now, Something is basically wrong if she is looked at only as a cook, a housekeeper, occasional companion, or a sex partner. Every man should give his wife the green light and allow her to tell him when she feels that he is not nourishing and cherishing her and not get mad when she do. Men sometimes have and I agree with that, tunnel vision. The reason some women are so malnourished is because they don't tell their husband how they feel. Your wife is a God-given treasure to be loved, cared for, nourished, and what? 
cherish. Now, the first one that I'm going to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, I'm comfortable home, watching TV, got my remote control, and if it's a sports game or something I like to hear, I'm great. I'll do that seven days a week, if that's, that's me. That's just me. I'm comfortable. But like I say, men have tunnel vision. We don't know it's time to take the wife out. We don't know it's time to take up this or do this for her. And a lot of women get frustrated because of that, and they get mad because of that because they say, all you want to do is sit home, watch TV, me cook the meal, bring your meal, all that. That's all you think about. You don't ever think nothing about, you know, cherishing me, nourishing me, other than just me doing my job in the house. Granted, we comfortable. Don't cross my mind. We ain't went out three months. <laughs> Don't cross my mind about, you know, maybe I'll, because I'm going to tell you something. I'm a different man on vacation than I am home. I don't mind admitting that. Because at home, I don't like going shopping with my wife. And I just tell y'all that. Because that's the truth. I I can't see going from store to store, hour to hour, and your hands are empty. <laughs> I, I just can't see that. That That's just me. I could do a lot of things. Walking from store to store, hurting my feet, hurting my back, sitting down, waiting, and you coming out that store with nothing. Now, now I'm asking God to help me in that department. Now, on vacation, I can do it. I I, I, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because I'm on vacation, and I just feel like I'm on vacation, and I got the time or something, but I could go from store to store, sit around hot shop, shopping mall for hours with and she may not come out with nothing. Don't bother me when I'm on vacation. But when I'm home, I guess because I just feel like I could be in my room, or I could be on my couch watching something or doing something. You understand what I'm saying? I'm just, I'm just telling you the truth. I, and, and the thing is that this is, women's love to shop. They love that. They love going out, doing all those things. And, but if a woman don't tell a man these things, and then, some women do tell them. And then, like, like we say, they get mad. You, you ain't got no business getting mad. Because the owner's manual say you are to nourish and cherish her. That's what the owner's manual said. And if we want to do what the, have a successful marriage, we need to follow what the owner's manual tells us to do. So your wife is a God-given treasure to be loved, cared for, nourished, and cherished. Thank God the bad part is over with. Amen. And the thing is, just do your part. That's what the owner's manual said. Keep focus on your part. Don't worry about her part. She got to keep focus on her part. So let's go to the wife. Now the wife's job description. Let's look at verse 33. 5 and 33. Let's see what it says. Do we have it? Now, we ain't going to read the whole verse. We're going to read the part for the woman. It says, and the wife see that she what? Reverence or respect her husband. So, the woman's job description. Verse 33 says, a wife's job is to what? Respect her husband. It said, let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. That's the wife's job, is to respect him. And Paul was done with 7,000 marriages. And they asked him this question. He said, when you have a fight or an argument, how does that make you feel? 83% of the men said they feel disrespected. 72% of the women felt unloved. So you see, it's love and respect. Now, what does a woman need? Love. And what does a man need? Respect. Now, what does respect look like? Huh? We see what love 
for a woman look like. Let's see what respect for a man look like. Let's look at Proverbs 14 and 1. Do we have it? Now, verse 1 says this here. It says, every wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pluck it down with her hands. Now, it's both a, both a wise and a what? A foolish woman. The wife is to build up her husband. And not tear him down. All right? And this is not easy for a lot of women because they get frustrated with their husband because of certain things and they can say words that tear him down. Now, just speaking from a man's point of view, you go out and do all you can and then you come home and she say, Well, what? You think you did something? Or you don't get anything? Uh, you got two feet going there and cooking yourself. You don't work two, two jobs, <laughs> 16 hours. You understand? A wise woman would build her husband up. A foolish woman would tear her husband down. You know a good man can be brought down by a bad woman. And the same thing for a good woman. A good woman can be brought down by a bad man. You understand what I'm saying? Or a foolish man. And so the thing is that the wife is supposed to build up her husband and not tear him down. Another thing is she is to make him feel wanted. I want you to want me. I need you to need me. That's in the heart of every man or husband. I want my wife to want me. I want my wife to need me. I want her to desire me. That makes a man feel good about himself, and that shows him what? Respect. You got a wife that don't want you, don't need you, don't desire you, that's showing no respect to a husband. Every man wants to be desired by his wife. Every man wants to be wanted by his wife. And every man wants their wife to what? To need them. That shows respect. And every man, I don't care who he is, he, he wants his wife to feel that way about him. So now, the woman is the respect. That's one of her job description. Now look at verse 22 through verse 24. Let's look at another part of her job description. It says this here. It says, wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands. And notice what it says, as unto the Lord. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wife be to their own husbands in some things, in everything. All right? This is her job description. All right? Verse 22 and 24 says that a wife is to submit or yield to her husband's leadership. To submit to him, to place herself under him. Now, again, how is a wife going to do that? Because every time you say that word submit, every time you say uh, 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 place yourself under to a, a woman, that, that just cringes in. They, they just, it's just something just sprang up in them. But God placed the man in the leadership role. And what the owner's manual said? He made Adam first and then Eve. And the man was deceived, but the woman was being deceived. 
she was in transgression. But the thing is, he said, for the wife is to submit or to yield to her husband's leadership. Now, how is that going to be done? The same way the man got to love his wife, how is that going to be done? It's going to be done by being what? Filled with the Spirit. Now, let's look at her job description most specifically. And look at verse 22. It says that you put, no, I keep, I keep falling back to that fourth chapter. Say, wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now look at what it says. The manner of the submission should be this. The manner or the attitude of submission is to be as to the Lord. How do you submit to the Lord? Grudgingly? Mean? Nasty? Huh? This is the kind of submission that God is requiring the wife to submit to the husband. As unto, if God came and told you, Miss Yvonne, I need for you to pray tonight, how would you do that? Would you say, wait a minute, I, I don't feel like it. You go right ahead and do it, would you? Because that's who? That's the Lord, all right? Now, this obligation of the wife is lifted to the highest plane. A wife who does not submit to her husband also does not submit to who? To the Lord. So if you don't submit to your husband, then it's just like you are not submitting to the Lord. That's what the owner's manual says. So it puts it on a higher plane. Now I'm, I'm going to tell you now, Sometimes you, some of the women get rough, but it, like I say, in order to do this, you got to be what? Filled with the Spirit. All right, let's go to verse 23. And see another her job description. It says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. It keeps everything on the level of what? Christ. Spiritual issues. Verse 23 speaks of the motive. We had the, the manner in verse 22. Now we got the motive of submission. The wife's supreme motive for submitting to a husband is the fact that he is her functional head in the family, just as Christ also is the head of the church. The head gives direction, and the body, what? Respond. Now, you'd be mad with your hand if you say, hand grab this bottle in the hand, say, I ain't doing it. Or your hand just jerked back. You, some, some, you, you say something wrong with that hand, wouldn't you? Look at here. A a physical body that does not respond to the direction of the head is crippled or what? Or paralyzed. Likewise, a wife who does not properly respond to the direction of her husband manifests a serious spiritual dysfunction. The supreme and the ultimate model of submission is who? Jesus Christ. By giving his own sinless life to save a what? Now, did Jesus pray till blood, sweat, drop came from his body? But he submitted. He said, not my will, but thy will be done. And brother, he, he said, if there was any other way <laughs> to save mankind, other than me going to that cross, he said, let this cup pass. But instead of it passing, he had to drink it. And he submitted because it was whose will? It was God's will. And so the same thing, he said, that should be your motive. Because Christ submitted unto the Father's will, then the wife should submit unto her husband's will. Because why? He's the head of the and, and And I'm asking you something else. Do the church rebel against his head? No. 
we as the body of Christ respond to our head because whatever he tells us to do, whatever he commands us to do, we are supposed to what? Submit to that. All right. Let's go to verse 24. It says, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ as his head, so let the wives be to their own husband in what? Everything. Now, I, I, I put this down here in verse 24. Speaks of a wife obedience in every lawful thing pertaining to the marriage relationship. In other words, if it's not lawful, if it's not spiritual, if it's not godly, she ain't got to submit to that. All right? But if it's related to the owner's manual, the things that God have given in the owner's manual, then yes, she is to what? To admit to that. When you go outside the manual and ask her to do things, then no, she don't have to submit to that. But when it's involving anything that the owner's manual say about marriage, then yes, she is to submit to that if at all it is possible. We'll put it like that. If, she could, if she's able to do it. All right. So when you talk about everything, we're talking about every lawful thing pertaining to to the marriage relationship. They are to obey their what? Husband. In the manner as the church is expected to obey Christ. The two are related. For by the Christian wife obedience to her husband, she is also acting in obedience to the precepts of Christ as a part of his what? Church. Just that we got all these commandments promises, blessings, and all these requirements that God give us as being saints or believers, the wife have the same thing as towards her husband, her job description. And so we can't say, well, I'm going to do Romans, but I ain't going to do Ephesians. We can't do that. Or I'm going to do Ephesians, but I'm not going to do uh, uh, Hebrews. You can't do that. We got to do it all. Everything that God has placed in the church and everything God required the church to do, we as believers have to do that. The Bible says we are called saints. So God ain't going to require us as his church to do anything outside of what? His will. We know that. And God won't, anybody who tell you God told them to sin, they told you a lie. God can't sin. God can't lie. Huh? God can't go against his own word, all right? So if he's requiring it to the church, then the church is to obey him in all of his precepts, all right? Let, let me just, last part, then we're going to have a question and answer. We got 15 minutes, so we'll have that. <laughs> it says in a summary, so the ingredients to a successful marriage is husband love and cherish your wife. Wife, respect, and submit to your husband. And the only way this can be done is by being filled with the Holy Spirit under the control of the Spirit. Okay, now you can you can cut off the, uh, the thing. And we'll have now an answer, question and answer. If anybody got any questions, Sister Boone.